Well, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, as we look at a passage that I think will be a help and blessing to you, and uh, starting in verse number 54, where Paul says, So in this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put, put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for this time we have tonight. Lord, thank you for this wonderful church. Lord, for the opportunity that we have to minister here, in, in, uh, among each other, and uh, over live stream and homes and other places. Lord, I ask you to help us to tune our hearts to sing your praise and to hear from your spirit tonight. Lord, would you speak to us? Would you help me to say those things that would be helpful and would be true to your word? And Lord, would you challenge us tonight? In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Tonight I'm not going to preach on the coronavirus. I'm not going to preach on hope or prayer. I'm going to preach on this. Why should I? Why should I? You know, there are some things that naturally go together. Now, those at home, if you'd help me finish, and those here, help me finish as well so I get some feedback, all right? I'll say the first word, you supply what goes with it. Peanut butter and jelly. jelly. Good. No one said bananas. I have to kick them out of church. Excommunicate them. Bread and butter. Bread and butter. And we should, Pastor, say real butter, right? Bread and real butter. Macaroni and cheese. cheese. So far, so good. You know, there was a quiz tonight. See, students, so you may not be at school. We bring school to you. Salt and pepper, ketchup, and mustard. Ah, here's a hard one. Bacon and ah, some said eggs. That was the right answer, but I changed my notes to say this, bacon and, and I made it bold, everything. Bacon and everything, all right? I've had chocolate-covered bacon. It wasn't my favorite, but it wasn't half bad, all right? Bacon and everything. In fact, I made bacon for my wife and I yesterday for breakfast, and uh, boy, bacon, but now I'm hungry, and you all folks are at home, and we're here without any chance to make bacon. And here's another one, a little trickier. Chocolate and... Huh, my wife, all right? She likes chocolate and anything else. Well, but there's... Some people say that there are some things... Uh, that don't add up, but they really do. They say some things shouldn't be together, but they, they are together. Like, like some would say that uh, being married and being in love wouldn't be together. But it is. It is, right? I mean, you hear those jokes about the, the guy who was married 50, you know, 15 years and complaining about his wife. You've heard those jokes and the, and the woman or husband. No, no. And they're saying that being married and being in love shouldn't be together, but, but they are, right? Or having kids and enjoying them or, or believing in God and being normal. Right? There's some that would say believing in God means you're not normal, but we'd say, boy, we're more normal than most people. There are also, though, some things, conversely, that don't go together. I've got a couple here. Uh, you, you may not get these, but I'm going to ask you again, all right? I'll say the first one, you try to get the second one that doesn't go with the first item, right? Oil and water. Oil and water. Oil and water. Not together. How about this? Forks and power outlets. Forks and power outlets don't go together. All right? Bathtubs and toasters. Bathtubs and toasters. Bathtubs and toasters don't go together at all. In fact, it's a, it's a bad idea. How about you and mornings? All right? You and mornings. Or I, I made a couple of my own. Um, a good cup of coffee and McDonald's. All right? They don't go together. Or uh, dentist and fun. Dentist and fun. All right? They don't go together. When this passage, I want to look tonight, the question, why should I? Say, Pastor Al, what did those things have to do with anything? Well, it'll make sense when I get to the end of my message, so hang in there, all right? I'm going to give an ending that's maybe a little bit different than you expect here. I want to look at tonight, though, what Paul said about these things, and the first thing I notice is that there is a dilemma. There's a dilemma, and we see that in the passage when he talks about this, that, that death is swallowed up in victory. But there's a sting of death, and there, there's a grave, there's a corruptible and incorruption. But there's a dilemma, and the dilemma is that there is death out there. You see, there's a dilemma that, uh, that, that means that there's a problem out there. The problem is that death is out there, something that we can't escape. And that is what Paul is talking about 
in this passage, at the end of this passage, he's talking about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. And this problem of death that infiltrates and affects every single person. Now, of course, we're going to see uh, the, the response to it, but there's a universal problem. You see, we really begin to die the day we are born. No one escapes death. Now, the Bible says that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. It's a universal problem. You know, it is, there are some people who are just naturally unlucky. I read a story about this man. I don't know if it's true or not. There are, it's all over the internet. His name was Henry Zeigland. All right? And there are people who said it's not true. There are those who said it was true. But it's an interesting story. Uh, it was years ago, maybe in the late 1800s. And it's a love story. Now, you ladies, uh, turn the live stream back to, to me as opposed to the Hallmark Channel, something else, because I'll tell you your own love story. Henry Zeigland broke up with his girlfriend. Like every good love story, there's a good breakup at the beginning of it, right? Broke up with his girlfriend. As the story goes, she was so torn with grief that she took her own life. Right? There's always some drama to love stories. But, but, his girlfriend who took her own life had a brother, as the story goes, who was extremely angry and hunted down Henry and was convinced that Henry had caused his sister's death and so he shot Henry Zeigland, as the story goes. Left him there to die there on the ground. Then the brother took the same gun and took his own life. So now Henry and his girlfriend broke up, the girlfriend committed suicide, the brother came and killed Henry and killed himself. But as fate would have it, the shot to Henry Zeigland with the gun just grazed his head and lodged in a tree behind him. And Henry recovered from this. He recovered, went on to live a, a, a long life. But about, they said, 20 years later, he was at the place of that tree where he'd been shot before. And the tree was in his way, as the story goes, and he decided to get rid of the tree. So he took some dynamite, as the story goes, and blew up the tree. As the story goes, the bullet had lodged itself in the tree. And 20 years later, when the dynamite blew up, the bullet came out of the tree, hit him in the head, killed him. And 20 years later, Henry died. Some people are just unlucky. Death is a universal problem. You say, Pastor, I don't think that's true. I have no idea. We can ask the Lord when we get to heaven if it's true or not. The fact is, there is a universal problem that we all will face, and that is, and that is death. I did hear about a man, a village in Spain. There was a tremendous lottery, apparently, in Spain worth 950 million euros. This small village of 70 people, 70 households, had all got together and bought lottery tickets, and they won. The problem was, they forgot about the old guy at the end of the street. And this poor farm community was rich, beyond their wildest imaginations, except for poor one unlucky man. You see, some people are unlucky, but the, the fact is, whether we're lucky or unlucky, there's a universal problem, and that is death. And, and Paul mentions that, that death, there is a problem with death here. It is unsolvable. Many people have tried to defeat death. Uh, Ponce de Leon tried to find the fountain of youth in Florida. And I've read some of the stories. There's stories about it where he went. And obviously we know, because he's no longer living, that he never found it. And yet the anti-aging market is projected next year to be at $216 billion dollars. So that people cannot be younger, so they can look younger. So your skin's less wrinkly and your hair's less gray and, and things that are sagging, you're not sagging any longer. The anti-aging market, but this, this thing called death is unsolvable. There is a dilemma that Paul presents. But he also, though, presents the defeat of the dilemma. Because he says in verse 55, O oh, death, where is thy sting, O oh, grave, where is thy victory? You see, this, this victory over death, it is sure. It is guaranteed. As I'm standing here before you, as you're watching, as you're sitting here, this victory over death is absolutely guaranteed through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sometimes when we're with our family, 
we'll do something and we'll make a good choice. Like, hey, we'll go buy, you know, this ice cream. It's an ice cream. We'll say this. It's a win for Team Howell. All right? A win for Team Howell. Sometimes Team Howell loses, but often, often Team Howell wins. Hey, we did that. That was great. Win for Team Howell. Play that game again. And, and uh, we have not always been a game family. When my wife and I first got married... People uh, were talking about how the games they play with their wives and husbands and having a grand old time doing that. And so we tried that. And my wife and I, I mean, we've just been married maybe a week or, or less than that. And we played a game called Othello. There's little white and black discs and you put them on a board and you, you trap them. And if you trap them, then you can turn them. And whoever has the most colors or the most of their one color wins. And we discovered something early on in our marriage that, that both um, Mrs. Howell, Doreen, and, and myself, we both like to win. We also discovered that neither one of us like the other person to win. All right, and so we decided there are many things that couples can do, but play games as a couple is not one that would strengthen our marriage. And so we do other things that strengthen our marriage, but not play games. We've been playing some games as a family, and I tell you, we've had some good times playing face 10 with the kids. And, uh, and we don't take it easy on the kids, they don't take it easy on us. But we have a good time, we'll get done with the game sometime, and that's a win for Team Howell. Well, I'll tell you this right now, this is a win for Team Jesus, victory over death. It's a guaranteed, it's sure. It will happen. We don't have to hobble along. We've already won. If we're saved in 1968 at the Olympics in Mexico, as the story goes out of the cold darkness, John Akari from Tanzania entered the far end of the stadium, pain hobbling his every step, his leg bloody and bandaged. And the winner of the Olympic marathon had been declared ours or over an hour earlier, and only a few spectators remained, but, but yet this lone runner pressed on. As he crossed the finish line, the small crowd roared their pre appreciation. And afterward, a reporter asked him, and they said to John, well, why he had not just stopped running and retired from the race, because he had no chance of winning. They said in his response, he seemed confused by the question. And he finally answered that my country did not send me to Mexico City to start the race. They sent me to finish the race. And as Christians, we are called to finish the race, all right? And we are called to finish in victory. Sometimes we feel like we're hobbling along with a bandaged leg, but we're not because we've already been given the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a sure victory, but it is a selective victory. See, I can't get this victory any other way. I can't do it myself, a DIY. I can't get a self-help book that help me get the victory over death. It's only through Jesus Christ. This victory is something different. You say, well, pastor, that's, incre that's incredibly intriguing. Thank you for telling us about the victory of Jesus Christ. That's wonderful. But if you would look at your Bibles for me, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I read from verse 54 to 57, and I left out the very last verse of the chapter. I left it out on purpose because it's my last point tonight. You see, this victory over death is a wonderful thing. The victory guaranteed through Jesus Christ over the dilemma of death, an unsolvable dilemma. And you could wonder, well, what should my response be? I should love God, and no doubt that is a noble response and one that we ought to show love toward our God. But Paul gives us a different duty. He draws a different conclusion than maybe you or I would have drawn if we'd been writing this book. Paul gives us, the, the inspiration, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this conclusion in verse number 58, where he says, Therefore, therefore, my beloved brethren, or because of what I've just said, therefore, make this decision, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know what Paul does right here? And I, I tell you, when I'm studying this, I, I once again, there are times I study and laugh. This is one of those times. Paul talks about death, talks about victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, and says, therefore, because of all that, make sure you're serving God. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. In case you're wondering, your labor's not in vain in the Lord. He, he wants us to, to know that if we've been saved from this unsolvable problem of death, our response ought to be one of duty. You see, we're still in ministry month. God wants us to serve Him. Why? Because He saved us. It's our duty. He tells us three things in this passage. First of all, to be steadfast. To be steadfast. 
to be still, to be rock solid. That's steadfast. Emmett Smith as is the current world record holder for the NFL rushing yards. He is not my favorite running back. Barry Sanders is, or was perhaps, until he retired. And yes, I still remember that day. But Emmett Smith uh, is the current record holder. He took it from what Walter Payton. Over the course of his 15-year career, Emmett Smith ran the ball for 18,355 yards. Yeah, everybody say, wow, wow, good, all right. Let me tell you how far that is. 14 miles, over 14 miles. He ran over 14 miles, pushing, shoving, jumping, rolling, through countless and massive defensive linemen. This wasn't like a 14-mile jog. It wasn't a 14-mile sprint. It wasn't a 14-mile leisurely walk. It was 14 miles on a turf where everyone or all the other teams want to smash him. And yet, he continued on. Their sole goal was to make Emmett Smith eat turf for lunch. And yet, he continued on. Their sole goal was to stop him, yet he continued on. And they stopped him on average, or they stopped him over 4,400 times. So for 14 miles, he was stopped on average every 14, or every, every four yards. Every 12 feet, he was stopped. Tackled by a big monster. Now, just picture that with me. I, I, I can't imagine running 14 yards with people trying to kill me every step of the way. But getting knocked down every four yards or so, every 12 feet, having to get back up and do it all over again and again and again, over 15 years worth of this, I think it brings a, a great picture of what it looks like to be steadfast for the Lord. That means that sometimes we may get knocked down. But a just man falls seven times yet riseth up again. We may get our teeth knocked in sometimes. It may happen. I, I read about the Apostle Paul and was reading this in my devotions recently in, in the book of Acts. When God called Saul at that point, he says, I'm going to call him and show him great things and I will show him how he must, he must suffer great things for my name's sake. He didn't say, I'm going to show Paul, Saul to be Paul, the great things he will do. He said, I'm going to show him the great things he may suffer. Yet if we could interview Paul tonight and ask him, Paul, was it worth it? Was it worth a shipwreck serving God? Was it worth a beating serving God? I have no doubt in my mind what his answer would be. He would repeat what he said here. Be steadfast, Christian. Be steadfast. It's all right. You may get knocked down. You, you may not uh, reach the goal today, but be steadfast. See, Paul says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Boy, that means sometimes getting out of bed when you don't feel like it, doesn't it? You jump on a bus when it's cold or when it's hot. Teaching a Sunday school class when it seems like no one's listening. Singing when your voice hurts. Working with babies as they scream and cry. Serving the Lord. Going out soul winning when your feet hurt or when, you're, when the weather's not nice out there. When the door slammed in your face. Wherefore, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Christian life, there's going to be hurdles and obstacles. But our job is to keep on moving forward. Be steadfast. He says, be steadfast. He says, be serving. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Not in the vacation of the Lord. He doesn't say vacation of the Lord. Or the relaxation of the Lord, but the work of the Lord. That means that we may just get a little bit dirty in the work of the Lord. We may get a little bit tired in the work of the Lord. We may get a little bit worn out in the work of the Lord. And that is okay. No one minds if, they, if someone has to work hard to get a job done. In fact, if someone is lazy, we don't compliment them, do we? We don't say, wow, that's tremendous. Look at that kid. They don't know how to work. What a blessing. But they're good at relaxing. We don't compliment the parents, but if, a, but if a young person begins to work hard, we'll say to the parents, wow, you've really taught your son or daughter to work well. We compliment the hard work, but why is it when we come to the Christian life, we expect some relaxation? Oh, I would go soul wanting, but it's my only day off this week, Pastor. 
What happened to the work of the Lord? Well, pastor, you know, I'm, I'm getting old now, so I can't be doing this any longer. And there's times to change ministries. But, but Paul says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Don't forget where I started, because we're saved from death. Through the victory through Jesus Christ, he calls us to be steadfast and he calls us to serve. But he calls us to focus and to be singular in our focus. He says it is the work of the Lord. You know whose work it is. It's his work. And if you know it's his work, you know that, that our labor is not in vain for him. It's his work. It's not my work. Hey, listen, I'm not sitting here uh, during the week and saying, boy, how can I get people to serve First Baptist Church because I need some things done. No, it's what will have the cause of Christ move forward. What can we do to reach more people for Jesus Christ? How can we see more people touched by the gospel? It's his work. And he'll reward those who work for him. He's a good, good master. He does good things for those who love him and serve him. He's never failed anyone yet. I'm not that old, but I could talk for a while about the goodness of God and what He's done in my life for our family. And here at First Baptist Church, God is a good God. And we want to be singular in our focus. He's a good God. He's a good master. And He'll do good things. See, we've been given a tremendous victory. An amazing gift. There's a Dutch pastor and his family during the Second World War. They got in trouble with the Nazis. They'd been hiding Jewish people in their homes. One day they were found out. They were captured by the Nazis and they were arrested and loaded into a cattle car to be taken to one of the death camps. All night long, this Dutch pastor and his family rode in the cattle car in heart-breaking anguish, knowing that they were on a one-way ride to a ticket of a sure death. In the cattle car, they were asking themselves in their minds, were they going to Auschwitz, where they were going? Finally, after what seemed like an eternity in the cattle car, the doors were open and the long night ended. They were marched out and lined up beside the railroad tracks, resigned to this life in this death camp. But in the midst of their gloom, they discovered something. Some good news. Some good news beyond, beyond belief. Because they ended up not in Germany at all, but they ended up in Switzerland. In fact, during the night they found out that someone, daringly and, and beyond belief, had switched, or tripped a switch and sent the train to Switzerland and to freedom. And those who lined them up outside the cattle cars were not their captors, but rather their liberators. Instead of being marched to death, they were welcomed to a new life. And in the midst of this joyful and wonderful occasion, the Dutch pastor said, What do you do with such a gift? You pass it on. You pass it on. I imagine that that Dutch family never forgot about that night. How could you? How could you? I imagine they felt a gratitude to those men and women who risked their lives forever. How much more can you and I as Christians not feel a, a sense of indebtedness to our God who saved us from death and the death camp of separation from hell, from Him and hell. John, in John chapter 3 said this, He must increase, but I must decrease. John had the right perspective. I asked you tonight, Christian, those who are here, those who are online, are you doing your duty? We've been saved from the dilemma with an amazing defeat of death, but now we have a duty. That is for him to increase and us to decrease. That is for me to serve and him to use me. Are we serving God? Are we being steadfast? Someone said this, none are so empty as those who are full of themselves. And we live in a time where we are full of ourselves. Our schedules, our needs, our wants, our fears. As Christians, we are called to something different. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, 
unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Are you serving him? Does he want you to do more? Or are you just full of yourself? Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I ask you to touch us tonight. Lord, I know that today looks different than last week. It may look different next week. But Lord, your word is just as true and you have opportunities for us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to serve you like we ought to. Lord, you've been so good to me, so good to all of us. Lord, you've saved us. Lord, you haven't saved us just to live a life to ourselves. Friend, those at home, those here, just a moment, the instruments will begin to play. And I encourage those who are here, stand to your feet. I have an invitation. And those at home, it's a piano place. If you need to do business with God, you do that right now. Maybe you're on a couch, you can bend a knee on the floor. Those who are here, the altar's open. If you need to pray, you pray and you, you get right with God. Let's make sure we do our duty because he's done so much for us. live a life just to ourselves, Lord, what a selfish life that would be, a life in service to you. Would you take, Lord, our feeble work and do something great? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, like most services, we have some pictures that have been submitted, and so we'll begin to play those. I want to tell us a couple things, a couple announcements, and announce the winners or who won from uh, our contest tonight. The uh, first child to win or the first children, it was the Goldsworthy girls won the first question, a snake. Yeah, give them a hand at home, I'll give them a hand here. And the second child to win the night was Iris Sutton. That's the daughter of Melody and Kyle Sutton. They'll be coming just a few weeks here. And so glad you won, Iris. And then for our teenagers, the Galbraith boys won tonight. And that would have been the question um, about Noah's father, whose name was... Lamech, yep, and then Maddie Cromwell won as well, and hopefully pretty quickly here, you'll have a Hungry Howie's Pizza on your way delivered to your house, and so it'll probably be worth sending a right answer. So we got those pictures, let's look through and see who was on line tonight and join us. There we go, a big gathering there. All right, look at that. And the dog. All right. We invite folks from all, <laughs> all walks of life to be with us. All right. <laughs> yes, my wife is here. Let me tell you a couple of just quick things. I've been asked about the outdoor night. And unfortunately, we can't at this time do the outdoor night. I've spoken to Brother Chad Shear, and uh, they're not able to travel right now. And Lord willing, we'll get that rescheduled. That's what he's asked for to reschedule that. And so as soon as I know more information about that, I will update you on that. I just appreciate your faithfulness. We are still going soul winning, so normal soul winning times. You come here and... Uh, 
and uh, if you want to come soul winning, we'd love to get the gospel out right now. We have special cards so people can log on and know where to log on uh, online. And so if you want to come soul winning, of course, Tuesday morning, ladies, and uh, Wednesday, teenagers, and then Thursday, men and ladies, and Saturday, soul winning as well. So I'm glad you're here tonight. The pictures will, will finish playing, and God bless you. We'll, Lord willing, see you soon.